Hi there. My name is Michael and I serve as the preaching pastor here at Redemption Hill Church. It is joyful for us. It is a great joy for us to be able to put out these gospel-centered resources. So whether they are messages or blog posts or videos uh, that help you, we pray that they will uh, spur you forward as uh, believers in Christ to be more like Jesus and to serve in the building of his kingdom. But may I add a word of caution, which is that you would not use these resources, however, as a replacement for your commitment to the local church and your submission to local church elders. For God has appointed elders as shepherds over your souls and the church is instituted by Christ as the means by which you mature in him and so we believe in the local church and we believe that God uses the local church and it is the will of God that you be part of a local church and so may this resource bless you and encourage you and bless your church and encourage your church but by no means replace your uh, the much needed commitment uh, that you must have towards your local church. May the Lord bless you and keep you and may this resource bless you abundantly. In Jesus' name. All right, as we begin our time with the word today, uh, let me invite you all to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Um, considering that it's a topical sermon, we will not necessarily be... Uh, um, exegeting the passage like we usually do but the idea is for us to be able to anchor what we look at on a particular text and so Ephesians 4 17 to 32 and for those of you who would have noted Ephesians 4 um, 13 to 16 is what we looked at last week and so we are essentially just continuing that portion as we look at it <clears throat> all right <clears throat> This is the word of the Lord. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after, li after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore having put away falsehood let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Since this is the second sermon on sarcasm and satire, I was thinking how to start with irony. Uh, what can I say that would be more appropriate to a sermon on sarcasm and so I wrote here in my notes I will keep this sermon short that's as ironical as I can get but I will try because as of late I have been warned that my sermons are nearing the one hour mark and exceeding um, when when we were uh, when we I rem we have the sermons from the very first sermons we preached when we planted the church 
and they were all an hour and a half long. They were all an hour and a half long. And um, the best that we've been able to do is bring it down to an hour. But the more we've had people join our church and come and be a part of our church who are not used to the length of the sermons, um, have often told us that the attention span uh, of any individual is just 45 minutes. Like that's, that's as far as you can go. It's only 45 minutes. It's not more than that. And uh, so ideally you want to keep a sermon to 30 minutes, maximum to 45 minutes. Uh, and I told them, well, then why don't you sit in movie theaters for 45 minutes and then just walk out? You know, you lose attention anyway. You watch it uh, half, half, you know, you watch one, you watch the rest the next day. That doesn't work. Why don't we reduce matches based on time? You know, cricket should be 45 minutes long. Football should be 45 minutes long. Gossip should be 45 minutes long. Like you should have a timer. When you sit down and you talk about people, just put a timer and no, you don't do that with anything, right? In fact, how about if I told you, you know, your attention span is so long, so small that we should not let children go to schools and study for hours, 45 minutes. That's it. You know, you shouldn't back to back pack them up with subjects. How will they stay focused? How can you send your child into the room and ask him to study for three hours and finish his... We don't do it with anything except with sermons. So I told them, <clears throat> with all the things that we need to do is expand our uh, uh, focus. To be able to sit longer, to hear longer. The, the solution is not to reduce that which is good for our soul, but to expand which is difficult so that we can endure more. So I say what we will do is we will continue preaching one and a half hour long sermons till you all get used to hearing it. And so we kept doing it, but we graciously reduced it to an hour. And then eventually I would occasionally preach the 45 minute long sermon and have people come up and say that was short. Like we didn't get to the meat of it. So it's part of training. If you know churches in China, they ask you, you know, David Platt once said when he went to China, they asked him to preach from... Uh, 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. <clears throat> that they wanted the whole counsel of God's word because they were only going to get him for a very short amount of time, right? It's oftentimes we let comfort dictate for us how things should go. So all of that just to say, uh, giving uh, a grand excuse for my long sermons. But regardless, uh, it, it I always do strive to keep it enough so that we are able to grab a hold of it. Hope to keep this enough. So, considering that we are now in the second week on the subject of sarcasm and satire, in our preparation for Matthew chapter 23, I thought it would be good to begin with a few qualifications. All right? Because I was assuming, and this is just my flesh probably, I was assuming that last week's sermon was going to end up in disarray and confusion. But it ended up with everybody saying, that was really nice. Now I'm concerned. So maybe I should do a little bit of qualifi qualifying before we get into more of it. So here are just three qualifications. All right. One of the biggest struggles we face in our generation has to do with narrowing down on definitions. Uh, a lot of arguments and a lot of debates have us speaking past each other simply because we've not taken the effort to clarify what we mean by our use of specific words. So we take it for granted that when we say something, that we both mean the same thing. But we live in an age where words are construed, they are all misrepresented, that we may not be speaking about the same thing at all. Take the word love. We would assume everybody means the same thing with the word love, but we know the word love has a complicated understanding in scripture. As simple as it may be, it has depths and so it needs to be flushed out. We need to know what we mean by what we say. So if we don't clarify what we mean by what we say, we speak past each other a lot. Especially those words that are misapplied by our culture. In fact, a lot of spouses fight with each other and the issues in their fighting has to do with not understanding the terms or how terms are used. You will often find them after the fight when they calm down, they will say, that's not what I meant. Yeah, but that's what you said. But that's not what I meant by what I said. What's happening there is an understanding 
of definition. So probably we want to start with that. We want to make sure that we are clear on definition. Sarcasm is one such example. The word means to use irony as a means to mock or convey contempt. How could that possibly be biblical? In fact, you will find a lot of good theologians who will say that sarcasm is bad. And when they flush out what they mean by sarcasm, I completely agree. So it has to do with definitions. What do we mean by sarcasm? The word itself just means to use irony as a means to mock or convey contempt. And we know from last week that mockery and contempt can come from a very bad place, but it can also come from a very good place. How? We can have a bitter contempt for someone who sins against us and not show them grace at all. And the intention behind that contempt is, is hurt. That you use sarcasm as a means to put down the individual in order to hurt them, not in order to build them up. You don't have their good in your heart, you have their harm in your heart. And it satisfies somewhat of your ego. And that's the sarcasm we are often used to, because that's how it's applied. On the other hand, biblically, we can have a genuine contempt for sin and yet extend grace and mercy to the sinner. That we can show contempt for what is happening and even show contempt for the sinner's attitude and yet do it in such a way that we want the sinner to see it. We want the sinner to be saved by it, by seeing how awful this is. The Bible teaches us that God hates both the sin and the sinner. So one of the, again, word problems that we have is the most common teaching that's, you know, prolific everywhere. It's prevalent everywhere in our churches, generally the teaching that God hates the sin but loves the sinner. But the Bible teaches us in Psalm 5.5, 5, the boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You hate evildoers. Oh, Psalms 11.5. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. The Bible does not teach us that God actually hates the sin, but the sinner is the one he loves. No, God hates both the sin and the sinner. That's why hell exists. Right? It, it is a flaming of his righteous hatred and anger and wrath. Yet, the beauty of the gospel is not that God sees the sinner as worthy or that God has a soft corner for the sinner or that God loves the sinner. The beauty of the gospel is that Jesus, while hating the sin and the sinner for the joy that was set before him, dies for the sake of the sinner. The depiction of the cross is to die for the enemy. The depiction of the cross is that Jesus went to the cross while we were yet sinners that Christ would die for us, for the joy that was set before him. The gospel is about turning the cheek. The gospel is about offering water to the one who wants to kill you. The Bible is about grace and grace so potent that it penetrates the enemy in such a magnificent way like the cross does. So, if we are to be Christ-like, if we want to be Christ-like, what do we do? We have to imitate Him. The first qualification then that I want to make as we go into this sermon, out of the three qualifications, here's the first qualification, is that sarcasm that insults without the intention to save and restore, without the purposes of grace, is sin. That's what it is. So any sort of sarcastic approach that does not have within it the central tenet of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins and the salvation of sinners and the destruction of the wicked. If these things are not held with tension, like I told last week, it's not a question of either or. It's a question of both and. And if we don't apply it with all of this present, then we sin. And so since definitions are a problem in our time, most Christians deny biblical sarcasm because they define all sarcasm as being without grace. 
and I would agree to this kind of a definition of sarcasm if it were not for the Bible's use of it. If the Bible didn't use sarcasm, I didn't have any problem with that definition. Because offhand, we have to all agree that contempt and insult isn't a good thing. Right? But the Bible uses it. Which means that there's a righteous way of using it. And no character in the Bible uses it more than Jesus. And we know Jesus did not sin. Any hurt that we may cause must be the effort of grace and not ignorance. It must be the effort to build and not to destroy. And that is what we are doing. <clears throat> Here's the second qualification. The second qualification is that we in our flesh are far more disposed to sin rather than to glorify God. This means that our primary problem is not our tendency to be soft because of an overflow of grace and righteousness. It is that sin and our flesh rocks us one way or another. Therefore, a simple application of satire or sarcasm or stepping that up is not the answer. So, I don't want you to hear last week's sermon and say, let me dial up sarcasm a bit. Because I've, I've, now I've got the free reins to do that. Okay, that's, that's not what you're supposed to do. And that's not what the message is supposed to convey. Rather, what the message is saying is, the sin in our flesh rocks us either way. Because we either want perpetual softness, which is a sin, because it does not rise when it needs to rise powerfully. Or we want to be sarcastic and insulting people and provoking everybody, which is also sin, because it is not of grace. Right? And so sin is the issue and we have to watch out for sin whether we imitate Christ in his love or we imitate Christ in his polemic, in his strong words and speech. So, considering that we stand on slippery slopes because one of the things we have to understand is that righteousness is the central matter and the stature of the maturity of Christ is what we are supposed to achieve. That's our purpose. This means that though gentle speech and satire or sarcasm are both available to the Christian to use it appropriately, he is capable of misusing both. But we must agree, and here's my main qualification here, that it's far easier to slip on satire than it is to slip on love. It's just because our hearts are inclined that way. One of the critiques that uh, John Piper gave Doug Wilson as a caution when Doug was talking about the same things he writes in his book on the serrated edge was he was saying that our instinct is to sin so easily with anger than to sin so easily with love. There, Here it's a much more slippery slope that we can just slip off but love requires a lot of effort in a sense for us to be able to measure up to that which I think is a good critique, which I think is a good qualification. So dialing up is not the answer. So it might be appropriate then, considering this sermon, that I say a disclaimer. So here's my disclaimer. All satirical speech quoted in this sermon were performed by trained professionals. Please don't try it at home. Don't take off this text and then go home and then let loose. because. In this sermon, we are going through scripture to look at some of those satiric elements and you might like some of them. And you might have itchy trigger fingers. But you shouldn't hold the gun because you'll fire everywhere. And that's not the intention. Training in righteousness and subsequently the wise and proper use of satire and sarcasm must not be rushed. Right? It's not that now that this is available for us, let's think about how to use satire. No. It's that understand that the scripture gives us all of these literary tools, these different ways in which we can confront and speak, not just the world's way of telling us about perpetual softness. That there is a way in which men have to be men and women have to be women and that looks with boldness and courage and strength and meekness and humility and all of it has to come together. That's the perspective we need to have. Now when we use that, we need to be careful. We need to be trained. 
we need to learn to learn. We have to understand that when it comes to things of risk and things of danger, you just don't hand it over to children. You teach children to be responsible in the way they handle things and give them things to use as they mature. And it is the same thing with Christ and His church. All of these things may be available to us, but it needs for us to be careful, measured, thoughtful, and trained, and growing in our spirituality and holiness as we use these things. Therefore, as much as you see the dangerous tons of these satires, both within the Bible and outside, your job is not to drive your marriage or your children or your friendship off a cliff because Pastor Mike said so. That's not what we're doing here. Good satirists train themselves. And this is what I emphasized last week with the previous verses of Ephesians 4. That the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds and teachers are charged with the task of training, with equipping, so that the saints may be equipped for the work of the ministry. And the work of the ministry involves the use of satire and sarcasm. But we must be trained on how to use it. You have heard far more sermons on love and far too little on this. That we have to understand that there is a disproportion in the kind of training that we have had. And so we need to be extra careful and thoughtful. And here's the final qualification. The third and final qualification is that none of this should be done without accountability. Whether it be our use of satire or our application of gentleness, your believing neighbors in the church must have a front row seat to the Christian walk you have so that the accountability in their fellowship will keep your guard and will keep you from your inconsistencies. You need to be in check always and the church allows you to be in check and so you shouldn't be without accountability, you should be with accountability. So that's my three qualifications just to front load that and say don't use these sermons as a way to dial up on sarcasm. So just as I did last week, we will dive into the passage of Ephesians 4 at the end. Um, but I want to start by surveying the scriptures to see some of the use of satire in the Bible like I told you last time. And here's basically what we're going to do. We're going to see satire in the Old Testament, some satire. And we're going to see the satire of Jesus. And then... I'm going to conclude with the language of Paul. And I get this basic outline with the help of Doug's book. And I think it's a very helpful outline. I want to go to the language of Paul because almost all of our understanding of softness comes from Paul. It's kind of strange, right? He was a pretty hard guy. And Peter said his language is pretty hard for us to understand. Yet all of our defensive posture in, a, in opposition to sarcasm comes from Paul because he's spoken much about being kind and soft and gentle just as we just read in Ephesians 4. So I want to go to the language of Paul and see how it harmonizes with what we are looking in satire and scripture and then we'll close and then next week we start Matthew 23 and then get a front row seat as Jesus takes uh, a JCB and rides it over the Pharisees. <clears throat> but let's begin with the prophet Amos in the Old Testament who took a jab at the Israelites for their complacency in Amos 6, 1 to 6. So this is the prophet Amos and he's speaking at to the Israelites against them and, and it has a jab because of their complacency. Here's what he says, Amos 6, 1 to 6. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion and to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria, the notable men of the first of the nations to whom the house of Israel comes. Pass over to Kalne and see, and from there go to Hamath the Great, then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms, or is their territory greater than your territory? O you who put far away the day of disaster and bring near the seat of violence. Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp and like David invent for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. This is the thing about biblical literature. If we don't do some background study, 
because we can easily read that and not see Amos emotion and the way he writes this and says it he's going to confront a people so he has to be careful about how he gives this confrontational speech this rebuke how is it going to come and the way Amos puts it is so so interesting because you see the security of the Israelites is no security at all because the walls of Jerusalem and the mountains of Samaria are not a fortress. Their God is their fortress and has always been. With pillars of fire and a cloud he has guarded and guided them, their heritage is that their God is their fortress. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, if the Lord is in their midst, they shall not be moved. Yet they find security on mountains because they are covered by the mountains of Samaria, they are covered by the walls of Jerusalem, there is no enemy that can attack us. But what Amos is calling them is to go into these lands, to go into Calne and Hamath and Gath of the Philistines, which have all been overtaken by Assyria, to ask the question, are you better than them? Because you are taking safety, so that's the context, in these things, but look at those great nations who have fallen, that's the comparison. So here comes the rebuke. This is, this is the comparison. Go see for yourself. But if I could paraphrase what Amos is saying, he's basically saying, well, you see all this? Gather around you fine gentlemen who grace the luxurious realms of ivory-laden beds, recliners fit for royalty, and couches that cradle you like kings of leisure. Come, you who indulge in unlimited popcorn, sip your finest wine, from oversized bowls. Who needs glasses anyway? And of course, are preparing for the imminent launch of David's groundbreaking new music album, The Idol Vibe. So cool. Do step a little closer. I have something of utmost importance to talk to you. That's Amos's language. He's calling them out in such a manner. This is not maybe offensive speech. This is as offensive as speech gets. Like Amos is making fun of them in their leisureliness, in how they take everything for granted. In fact, the jab, the jab he makes with David is, is most interesting because they were singing songs and they were idle songs. They were not songs that were worshipping God truthfully. They were meaningless songs. And they were making these songs and inventing music and he takes a jab at them since you're all trying to be like David. Right? That's the kind of language he has. And he says, come close, come, I want to talk to you. I want to discuss something very important with you. And look at the last word. Anoint themselves with finest oil, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Which is like saying, come, come, I want to talk to you, but take your time. Don't, don't worry, it's not like your house is on fire or anything. But just take your time. But their house is on fire. Why is their house on fire? Their house is on fire because they have rejected their God. When here it says that you put away the day of disaster and bring near the seat of violence, they are so complacent that what they are doing is they are not bothered about the day of destruction or the day of reckoning. They are saying, don't worry about it. It won't come now. And yet in their streets is rampant violence. Violence against the poor, sinfulness. All sorts of sin is happening before their eyes all sorts of violence, but they say that the day of reckoning is long away. So he takes this ironic picture of Israel's false safety and then mocks it and calls them out on it. If any man were to do that today, if you were to walk in to a nominal Christian denomination, anyone, I don't have to name them, and you were to make fun of their nominal worship, you would be regarded by evangelicals as being unloving. That's what Amos does. He makes fun of it. And that's what satire is used for. Not in order to insult for the sake of insulting, but in order that the insult might awaken them to repentance. There is an appropriate way to use this. Don't talk about other churches. Don't talk about the folly of other churches. Don't talk about the nominality of other churches. Don't do that. Let's focus on the gospel. Why are we getting sidetracked? 
I like how, <clears throat> again, how Doug Wilson put it. He said that people say that we must be gospel-centered as though we put a Bible or Bible-centered as though we put the Bible in the center of the room. You can say that we are a very Bible-centered home because in the center of the room is a pillar with a Bible. So the Bible is in the center. Or you can be biblically centered because the Bible is like an engine that drives everything in your life. So is it functionally central or is it positionally central? And for much of Christian evangelicals, it's just the position. But if we are to be biblically centered, then out of the grace and love we have for these churches that are nominal and driven astray, we will use all means by which they might come. And sarcasm has been a biblical means to call them and awaken them. But our culture tells us it's unloving. But if we look to scripture, we find that that is not true. My favorite is the book of Proverbs. Because the book of Proverbs has it in for the sluggard. The book of Proverbs targets the lazy man like anything. It's the favorite one. The book of Proverbs likes to use satire over. All of us struggle with laziness. But men, let's admit it. More than women, generally, tend to struggle with laziness. Imagine, as you go through the scripture, imagine that this is speaking to you. Imagine this is said to you. Not just, not just because it's some scripture that you read, but imagine this is aimed at you in public in front of all. Here's Proverbs 26, 14. As a door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard on his bed. So a snoring sluggard is like a door with a squeaky hinge. So the door goes squeak. So the sluggard moves in his bed, makes a noise and turns. Or Proverbs 22, 13. The sluggard says, there is a lion outside, I shall be killed in the streets. Something that Doug Wilson points out that I found very interesting, especially in this kind of satire, is that, you know, in, in when, here's a side note, in debate, when you engage in any sort of debate, there is a common logical fallacy called the straw man fallacy. I think Ashok has mentioned it in between in one of his sermons. A straw man fallacy is basically when an opponent runs out of defensive measures. It is like the last, the last defensive measure, evasive measure that he can employ is the straw man argument where the opponent tries to refuse, refute an argument by making a caricature of that argument, right? By trying to misrepresent that argument, make a caricature of that argument that is easy to dismantle and then dismantles that as though, as though he answered the argument. So there's a powerful argument coming against him. He can't deal with that. He creates a straw man, which is easy to bring down. And he misrepresents it and brings it down very boldly and speaks very boldly. And it can, if done really well, look like he answered the argument. But it's called a straw man fallacy. It's a straw man argument. In fact, when you debate or when you've had debates with people, you've have seen them use it. Now you have a word to use there. It's a logical fallacy. It's a straw man argument. That's not the argument I'm making. Answer the argument, right? So instead of dealing with the actual argument, we deal with the phantom of that argument. That is straw man fallacy. And it's bad debating, but it's useful satire. It's bad debating, but it's useful satire. You find Jesus, and in several portions of the Bible, the scripture exaggerates the foolishness of the foolish in order to get their attention. The Bible exaggerates and for the feel of an epic destruction, it exaggerates, it gives a different picture and destroys it so that it gives a certain sense of feel and receptiveness to the one who hears it. But it's an exaggeration. No lazy person says, there is a lion outside, I can't go out. Only crazy people do that. Lazy people don't do that. Right? But what here, when, when that exaggeration is mentioned here, what is meaning is, no sluggard 
although I, no sluggard says that there is li there's a line in the streets, the, exa the exaggeration goes to show how the sluggard makes inexcusable excuses with ease. Right? He makes inexcusable excuses with ease. So, wh why didn't you come today? Oh, I slept off. Why is that excusable? Right? You've given a quick answer as though it was normal, but it's not normal. It's not how you respond. It's not, it's not the answer. But a slugger does that. A slugger is quick with his excuses, but they're often inexcusable excuses. And so the Proverbs takes that, exaggerates it, and says, gives an example of his excuse, which is, there's a lion outside and I shall be killed if I go out. Or how about this? Proverbs 19.24. If I can make mention of something, satire was not meant to play fair. Proverbs 19.24. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish and will not even bring it back to his mouth. Right? Again, you have a polemic. Again, you have an exaggeration. Again, you know it's not true. But the exaggeration is meant to show us that a sluggard's efforts are always half-hearted. That he'll go halfway through and not finish his task. And so if there's people who will not finish the task that they do, maybe they're sluggards. Maybe it's coming out of laziness. Here are some more worthy mentions from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 26, 17. I love this one. Whoever meddles in a quarrel, not his own, is like one who takes a passing dog by the ears. And they say there's no sarcasm in scripture. Whoever meddles in a quarrel, not his own, is like one who takes a passing dog by the ear. He's, he's asking for it. And he gets it. It's the, it's the way the scripture tells us. Or, here's one. Proverbs 27, 14. So, I had a tough time finishing the sermon on time because half the time I was laughing. Whoever blesses his neighbor with a loud voice rising early in the morning will be counted as cursing. Whoever blesses his neighbor with a loud voice rising early in the morning will be counted as cursing. All this is in scripture and it's made to meant is it's meant to make us laugh and, and chuckle and see the absurdity but then through the absurdity see the truth. Through the absurdity see why we need to waken up to certain things and lighten up about certain things. All of it is funny as long as you avoid cultural sensitivities. All of this is funny as long as it's not about us specifically. But it's all about us specifically. It is not tolerated in our age if men were to ever remark about women in such a fashion. Now you can talk about the sluggard, but you can't talk about the woman that way. Especially not a man. Speak about a woman that way. And if we buy into that view, wives will have to rush to censor certain verses in their Bibles before their husbands accidentally read it. And we know that most husbands read their Bibles accidentally. Yeah, a sermon on satire has, at the end of the day has to live up to its expectations. Here's Proverbs 11.22. Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. Like a gold ring in a pig's sn snout. It's like the, the pig sneezed and there's this gigantic snout. And a gold ring is in it. Which man here will pick that ring? No ring is gold enough for any man to put his hand in a pig's snout. Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. When you see such pictures in the Bible or such de depictions in the Bible, you have to use your imagination and to picture that sight. 
this causes great offense to the woman. And the book of Proverbs intends that offense. But it also makes Christian women laugh because it's extremely funny. Right? This is how sarcasm is employed. Just as the book of Proverbs go goes after the sluggard, goes after the lazy man, so does the book of Proverbs go after quarrelsome wives. So does the book of Proverbs go after women who are not living according to the glory of God. You have it in scripture and the point is, again, qualification, men, you don't go home and use these verses. Here's Proverbs 19.13. A foolish son is ruined to his father and a quarrelsome wife is continual dripping of rain. Right? A continual dripping of rain is a noise you continually hear but are not bothered by. That rain is not going to cause you to move mountains ever. But you're going to constantly hear it fall. And that's how it is with a quarrelsome wife who continues to nag and repeatedly say, your husband is not listening to you. It's, it's almost become white noise. It's the rain that he hears outside and it means nothing. Which is what the book of Proverbs is saying. Or how about this? Proverbs 27, 15 to 16. A continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome wife are alike. And here's to restrain her. You now you have to tell her not to do it. To restrain her is to restrain the wind. You can't do it. You can't stop the wind. Or to grasp oil in one's right hand. Imagine oil falling and you're trying to grab it. So it is to restrain her. And of course, all men's favorite, all husbands' favorite, Proverbs 21, 19. It is, to, it is better to live in a desert land than to, with a quarrelsome and fretful woman. Wives, if you're quarrelsome and your husband is surveying deserts on Discovery Channel or YouTube, you know what's happening. <laughs> know what's happening and you you begin to see that the employment of these kind of satirical language is not meant to destroy but it is meant to shake and at some points meant to hurt and what we do as Christians is we look at these passages of scripture and don't go that's unloving that's unkind we look at this and go that's a good way to awaken our senses and when our senses are awakened, we laugh about it. But when we don't see it and we live in that blind spot, it is often necessary for some measure of the Bible to speak to us in this way, to awaken us from this. If that's the book of Proverbs, let's look at the book of Job. Job's jab at his friends. This is Job 12.2. This is Job, after his friends have given him so much counsel and so much advice, this is what Job says. No doubt, after all your counsel, no doubt, you are the people. You are the man. You are the people and wisdom will die with you. God forbid that you should ever die after counseling me today. What would wisdom do without you? Is what Job is saying. It's, it's a direct mockery at his friends, but they're not seizing, they're not stopping. And so Job resorts to satire. But what about if that's Job's jab at his friends, what about God's jab at Job at the end of it? This is God's response to Job in Job 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Everything about that phrase has a problem. Counsel is not meant to darken and words are not without knowledge. But who is this that darkens counsel with, by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. You should see the sarcasm there. 
God the all-knowing, man the no-knowing, and God says, I will question, I will ask the questions. It's a Q&A session. You sit on the seat, I will sit in the audience, I will come to the mic and ask the question, you give me the answer. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? It seemed appropriate to God to use sarcasm to confront the idea that a man dare ask God to justify his actions. That no other means of response was more appropriate than sarcasm. When Job went up to God and wanted answers. And look at the outcome of what godly satire does. Job 40, 1 to 5. And the Lord said to Job, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. Then Job answered, All, and mind you, Job 38 to 40 is a complete demolition job by God who asks question after question full of sarcasm and satire. And after getting a truckload of this, Job's response is this. Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. There are many more references, a lot more. But if I picked all of them, I would have stayed back home laughing for the glory of God than preaching here. But they are all over scripture. We, looked, we saw Elijah's taunt last week. When the prophets of Baal were waiting for fire to fall down, Elijah said, your God stuck in the bathroom. Somebody should go and unlatch him, help him. But if that's the satire of the Old Testament, let's quickly look at the satire of Christ. Last week, I introduced two categories of satire. The Horatian satire, which is more subtle, and the Juvenalian satire, which is more harsh. It's more in your face. And Jesus used, used both kinds of this satire, but the latter he used more. But he did use both. Here's one of his more subtle ones, John, John 10, 32. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? I've used many. You know, look at all that. Many good works I've done. Which one specifically do you want to stone me for? Or Luke 13, 33. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. Don't worry, I won't leave town. I'm here today, tomorrow. Come find me when you want to kill me. So after all, it's, it's, a, it's my job. I'm, I'm a prophet. It's my job to die here, in your hands, by your hands. And we saw this last week as well, the camel through the eye of a needle, right? The picture of a rich man trying to enter the kingdom of God with all his riches is like a camel trying to enter through the eye of a needle. Here's another one, Matthew 7, 1 to 6. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce you will be judged, and with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eyes. So think about it. <coughs> Here is again is a vivid picture that is not merely symbolic. In fact, most of us know this and look at it with utter seriousness, which we should in some, some sense, but God expects us to look at it and laugh. There was this, I don't know who did it, I don't know if it was from the reform circle, but there was this cartoon depiction of this, where the brother tries to take the speck out, but the log does not allow the brother to stand in front of him. And, and he can't see the brother's speck clearly either. And they go to and fro and the brother finally is knocked unconscious by the, by the log. And so, and you have a very funny picture that's drawn there, which is what Jesus is trying to draw. Like you have to have the imagination to think about what's happening and then chuckle at the irony of what's happening. 
the absurdity of the picture is the absurdity of the hypocrisy of many Christians. But the point is this. So many of us, when confronted by our sin, especially by our spouses, like to respond by saying, what about the log in your eye? You want to find sin in me? What about that log in your eye? You've got far more things to worry about. And the point is, you've both got logs in your eye. Nobody's got specks. Okay, everybody is full of logs in their eyes and you can't see anything. Right? That's how absurd it really is. But the picture is meant to tell you to take attention of your own before you take attention of another. And Jesus shows the absurdity of a person who cares nothing about his own sin but cares everything about another person's sin. That's the picture. Two sinners, two Christians who are sinners, who confess their sin and work on each other, should not be using this verse at each other. Because that's not the picture. Because the picture is meant to depict the Pharisees and the people who care nothing about their own sin, but care everything about other people's sin. Here's Matthew 15, 14. Let them alone, they are blind guides, and if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. The sarcasm here is in the instruction, let them be. This is Jesus coming and saying, just don't do anything. Just let them be. They'll drive themselves into the wall. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to be overly worried about anything. They are blind, leading the blind. They'll all go and fall into a pit. And so the irony of the, the sarcasm of the picture is, you have to picture Jesus and his disciples standing with their hands crossed, watching as a bunch of blind people lead a blind people and there's a pit. And they're nearing that pit and they miss the pit. And they circle around and they come and they nearly miss the pit. And they're waiting, waiting, and then finally they fall into the pit, and then they go for lunch. That's, that's the picture the Bible is trying to draw for us, for us to see the absurdity of the blind leading the blind. Or Matthew 7, 16, you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Jesus is not making a serious case of horticulture. Jesus is not trying to make a serious case of how to grow gardens. That's not the discussion here at all. Jesus is just talking sarcastically about the things that are so absurd and he's bringing an absurd picture so that we see if you claim to be Christian, if you call me Lord, Lord and have no lawfulness, then that's, has, that's how absurd you are as a Christian. So, Jesus employs such sarcasm through and through. And interestingly enough, you see how we've traversed all of all of these are quotations from Matthew. And you see how we've traversed through the book of Matthew, reached here and never saw them as sarcastic and satire. And so now we can go back and read and understand that that's the literary feature used. We will have our hearts full when we reach Matthew 23 and see what Jesus does to the Pharisees. What a way to begin 2024. But as I mentioned to you last week, a lot of these things, and I wanted to go through these scripture verses today so that we get a feel of what it looks like. And as I mentioned to you last week, a lot of what I have to say comes from Doug's little book, uh, The Serrated Edge. And I would have you know that there are many critics of this book. But I like him better. But the book has so much more to offer than I can cover in two sums. And Doug dives not only into the details of these satirical elements, but also goes to draw the balance of tender-heartedness. Because the scriptures ask us to be tender-hearted. So he calls a good balance between tender-heartedness and what he calls less than perfect tenderness in using satire. And how they go hand in hand. And so I would encourage you who can get the book, grab it and read it. It is a lovely read. But in closing, then let us let me take us to Ephesians 4. In Ephesians 4, verses 17 onwards, 
we have the same language of Paul continuing from last week where Paul says, speak the truth in love. And I mentioned that he says, speak the truth in love, not speak the truth in perpetual softness. Love is not perpetual softness. Love is not a rose trampled on the ground. Love is not a delicate flower caught in the thunderstorm. Love biblically is the thunderstorm. It is the thunderstorm of passions. Love is strength. Love is courage. Love is boldness. The love that cares for a child is the same love that sends a man into the battlefield to drive a spear through his enemy for the protection of his family and his homeland. Love is so much more than perpetual softness. And Paul says, speak the truth with that love, with all the measure of that love. That means you will bring every faculty of love possible for the glory of God and for the good of the one whom you speak the truth to. And Paul continues, and we have from verses 17 to 20, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They were darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God, ignorance in them, hardness of heart, become callous. They give themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every impurity. That is the past. That's not who you are today. You look at your past and you see the life in the flesh, the root of all sin. And out of the root of all sin will always arise arrogance of unbiblical sarcasm and satire. That's not the kind of life you live anymore. The reason the Bible is able to employ such language is because we were not like that. That's not the heart of the kind of people that we are. Verse 20, but that is not the way you learned Christ. In other words, it's not on that road that you learned Christ. It did not lead you to Christ. It led you away from Christ. Verses 21 to 24, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. So here are a bunch of people who have heard about him and have been taught in him, trained in him, to put off your whole self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. So if anything comes out of our old man, it will always be to hurt for the sake of your ego. It will always be to cause pain and not bring glory to Christ. Paul saying, don't be the old man, be the new man. Put on the new man and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So the new man has a new mind. A new man thinks differently. A new man purposes things differently. A new man has different motives. Put on the new minds, the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. It's so interesting. We were always created after the likeness of God. But Paul says, be created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness, which is be restored now into the likeness of God, into the likeness of Christ. And verse 25, therefore, having put away falsehood, so this is all about conversion, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So we're putting aside falsehood, lies, deception, everything that is of the world and that is evil. And we're putting on the new self that is of Christ. And look, the, look at the command. Speak the truth with his, with his neighbor. It's again repeated. In fact, as you read Paul throughout this discourse, Paul seems to have a great degree of concern about speaking the truth. It's the central action, imperative. The command that is given in this is speak the truth. And you can't do it unless you get rid of the old self and put on the new self. And having done so, now just go speak the truth. Verses 26 to 27. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. This is Paul, in the passage of tenderness, giving you a direct command to be angry. Be angry. But don't be Hulk. 
be angry don't lose control be angry but do not sin do not let the sun go down on your anger so if you are to be angry and that's a command and you're righteously angry you have to get that anger to do something before the sun sets that anger must be applied that anger must be worked out before the sun set lest you give an opportunity to the devil because once the sun sets just as hot lava co coals up into a coal so will your anger turn to bitterness it will be just a callous rust that accumulates on your heart and it will be black but don't do that go and do what is justifiable and right with that anger and verse 28 let the thief no longer steal but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need so interesting that's so out of place in an entire passage on speak the truth speak the truth don't be like the old self be the new self okay don't steal anything huh? and then speak the truth and speak the truth it just doesn't fit because what here Paul's trying to say is not to talk about thieves but to use thieves as a metaphor because thieves <coughs> let the thief no longer steal which is let the sinner no longer sin rather let him do something so thieves are used to stealing but having put on the new self let him labor doing honest work with his own hands who will give a thief honest labor who will give the thief work for his hands that's the one thing you want to avoid his hands because that's what he uses to steal right this is another way of jesus saying rectify the abuse with the proper use the metaphor is saying and the metaphor specifically talks about speaking before and after that verse so if we stick with the flow of the argumentation and we use speech because speech is all over the place it would mean don't speak like you used to speak don't be a thief with your words don't be a sinner with your words but put on the new self speak properly put to proper use do honest work with your tongue that you may have something to share with anyone in need verses 29 to 30 let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may bring grace to those who hear and do not grieve the holy spirit of god by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption so no speech even satirical speech or sarcasm is meant to corrode it's meant to be corruptive is meant to destroy the individual that's not the intention but do that which is good for building up and the interesting thing about such language is that it does not anchor itself on specifics it's god asking you by the power of the spirit to be wise no corrupting talk what is corrupting talk he doesn't give you a list he asks you to discern the talk that is corrupting he doesn't tell you the talk that will build up but he asks you to build it up nevertheless which means you have to use the wisdom given to you by God to determine what is corruptive and what builds up as fits the occasion. So it involves thinking about the occasion. What is the word that needs to come out that will build up and not destroy given the occasion? This is God saying this is a very case to case basis. On how you need to know how to use this and you need to be wise that it may give grace to the hearer and the intention is grace you could take this verse and use it as a rebuttal or a rejection of satire if you read it that way but if you try to harmonize scripture then you begin to realize that Paul's not contradicting himself. In fact, Paul's use of sarcasm always went really close to the edge. Paul's sarcasm 
to the people who were talking about circumcision and making a big deal of circumcision was that they should probably just go ahead and cut it off. They should just go ahead and cut themselves off. That's the kind of language he used. Why are you worried about cutting a little bit of your foreskin? Cut it all off. Cut, cut, cut your whole body off. Is the language Paul uses. The no corrupting talk guy. And the reason was because it was not corrupting talk. The reason was because it was meant to shake, to provoke, to insult, so that they may realize the seriousness of what they're looking at. Verses 31 and 32, concluding. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. There are things to put away. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander. Those are not the purposes. We're supposed to put away these things. Again, here you see the use of the word anger. So there is an appropriate anger and there is an anger that is not appropriate. But there are also things to put on, which is tender-heartedness, kindness, forgiveness, and, God, and knowing that as God in Christ forgave you, you need to forgive others. A Christian satirist is all of these things. And the argument that I want to make in these two sermons was that in order to be tender-hearted, kind and forgiving one another, you don't have to give up sarcasm or satire or speech of that kind that provokes and confronts because you can do both at the same time. And Jesus was ever kind, ever tender-hearted, ever forgiving and ever so funny. And he took people to task with these strong words. Let me give you just one line each in a response to a review of this book Doug Wilson put out. It was very interesting. Uh, he put out, I think, a 30-point what a godly satirist should be. And I'm not going to include all of it. I don't have time. I'm just concluding. But if you want the whole list, you can come up. I can send you the link. You can read it. But it's so interesting. He uses scripture after scripture to talk about how a godly satirist should think. And here are the top ten. And then we'll close in prayer. A godly satirist should be a member of a worshipping community of orthodox and faithful Christians. And he should live in such a way as to be accountable to others for his words and actions. A godly satirist should be steeped in the language and categories of scripture. Which means he should know the Bible really well. A godly satirist should have a warm and affectionate relationship with his wife, sons, daughters, mother and father. A godly satirist should be well educated, well read in the kind of literature that he is seeking to contribute to. A godly satirist should study to learn the quantitative boundary between satire and scurrility, knowing from the outset that there is such a boundary, which is moving from satire to just harm and just put down. You don't do that, knowing that from the outset that there is such a boundary. A godly satirist should study the qualitative, dif sorry, uh, yeah, the difference is in the timber and the tone. He should understand the difference between the quantitative boundary, which is the previous point, and the qualitative boundary. In the amount, in how you do it, how far you can go, and the quality that it must have, that what you say in tone can make a difference. That the way you say it, make it makes a difference. It's not just about what you say, it's also about how you say it. A godly satire, I love this one. A godly satirist should not be too young. A godly satirist should, and he has scriptures for all of it. A godly satirist should target lack of proportion, not exhibit lack of proportion. A godly satirist should look carefully and regularly at the effect he is having on younger Christians who know him and desire to imitate him. A godly satire, a satirist should should have long experience in letting love cover a multitude of sins. And on and on and on it goes and you begin to realize by the end of it, you need training in order to do this. And you don't just go home 
and turn up the dial. And we realize that God employs it proportionately and we must be trained in our proportionate use of it with accountability and know that God uses all such uh, speech for the glory of his name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you. We give you all the honor and glory. In the hearing of your word, may your people be equipped and blessed in Jesus' name.